Hi, Laura back again, and this time with another level four question. So this is a question that could come up in either L4M1 or L4M8. So I decided to go through it to essentially make sure you're getting the best outcome, because sometimes there are different things in the book that can kind of confuse you. So I wanted to make it as clear as possible. So as usual, when you're answering any exam, you need to think about statement explanation example. So as we're going through this question, I'm going to be saying this is your statement, this is your explanation, and here's your example. If you do all of these three things, then you should guarantee yourself a good score in that exam. So let's start on part A of the question. I'm going to make this full screen so you can see it. Outline using examples five elements of the total cost of ownership of capital equipment. So in your introduction, you should always try and define something. Here you should give a definition of the total cost of ownership. That's the cost of an item over its entire life. And maybe you want to define capital equipment, something that's high risk, high value for use at the long term in the organisation. And then what I would suggest is these are the five elements that you should learn. These are the categories that you would learn. Now, what I've done on this screen is I've gone through the statement and explanation, but not necessarily the example. So you might want to start in your introduction to talk about an example of capital equipment. Now, if your organisation has bought, I don't know, a machine, premises, something along those lines, then use that example. For me, the generic is usually buying a new machine for the production line. So once we've got our introduction, we can go into our five paragraphs. Each one of these should be its own separate paragraph. And in the exam, you can put headers in to make it clear for the examiner. Pre-acquisition cost. So these are the costs that are associated with the capital item before you even purchase it. So that's the research costs. Any tendering costs, because you're probably going to be tendering as this is a large value item negotiations, any site visits, particularly if it's international, you'd have to travel across the world. All of this can lead to an extensive amount of cost. Then we have acquisition costs. So acquisition costs are basically the cost of acquiring or purchasing that item. These include things like training, delivery, exchange rate costs, the purchase price itself, and spare parts. Now, a lot of students get confused with spare parts being in acquisition and not operating. Well, spare parts can be in both, by the way. But when we're purchasing a good, we always want to work on a Kanban system. And Kanban is a two bin system. So basically, we always want to keep one bin full. So if you think of two bins, as soon as one is empty, we will reorder because we have that one bin in hand. That's what we're doing with spare parts. We buy extra spare parts up front, so we've always got that one in hand. Then we've got operating costs, salaries, energy usage, insurance, possible new staff training, any holding costs of the machine. So operating costs are the costs of actually using the machine. Maintenance cost. And that kind of can break down into two different categories, scheduled or preventative maintenance and breakdowns or corrective maintenance. So obviously you cost of scheduled maintenance, but if you've got breakdowns and you've got the cost of repair and the downtime cost associated while you repair that item. So all of these can add up to quite costly uh, amounts for an organization. And then finally, disposal costs, end of life costs. So what we're gonna think about with all of the disposal costs is all of the Ds, decommissioning, depreciation, and disassembly. So decommissioning is where you are taking something apart and basically making it safe. It's used for nuclear re reactors and other capital items and so on. And maybe getting rid of chemicals and looking at what can be you know, recommissioned or reused. Depreciation is the loss of value of an item. So as soon as you drive a car off the forecourt, a new car, it already depreciates. And disassembly is taking the item apart. So those are your five categories. Now it's 10 marks. So for this question, you could get away with doing pretty much um, what I've just done, just explaining these points here and get a nice 10 marks in the bag. But there could be a 25 mark question. And if this is on L4M8, remember it will be on a case study. So you have to link it back to the case, every single point that you make. 
So I love this question. I think it's a great question to have. But do remember to look at the amount of marks. This and the command word. The command word here is outline. So for 10 marks, we are just outlining it. We're not going into too much detail. For 25 marks, you'd have to drill into every point and explain it. So let's look at part B. Now, part B was the trickiest one from the old qualifications that students would struggle with. And just in case they start to reuse something, I thought it was worth us having a look at this. So let's make this full screen. So B, it is widely believed that it is important to attempt to reduce costs and add value throughout the supply chain. Explain three innovative strategies that might achieve such goals. So I know this question can seem a bit uh, scary at first. However, basically what this is asking for is any strategy that reduces costs and adds value. So you can say anything here. I've picked three things, but you could choose many others. So don't worry if you wouldn't have personally said some of these. So definition, a supply chain refers to the organisation that participate in the flow of products, services, finance and information from a source to a customer. So I decided to essentially define supply chain. You could define added value or anything along those lines. My first one that I've gone through is tiered suppliers. So supplier tiering is my innovative strategy that I'm talking about first. So you can put it as a header and then you're able to kind of spread out your paragraphs underneath this. So procurement can utilize the use of tiered suppliers. This is when one or more main suppliers is given responsibility for a certain part of the supply chain, meaning that they deal with suppliers further down rather than procuring organization dealing with all the suppliers themselves. So the way to think about this is instead of us doing everything and buying from supplier A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we will just buy from supplier X and Y who will source everything for us from that. This saves us time. And remember that these suppliers might be buying in bulk for other people. So we might get these uber economies of scale that we would never have got on our own. So benefits, when products require a certain level of expertise, this expertise can be sourced through the tiered supplier. So we get their expertise, that's how it adds value. Because remember, we've got to bring it back to the question, how does it reduce cost? How does it add value? It adds value because it allows them to develop long-term established trusted relationships with key suppliers. It's helpful as well when there's been a consolidation of suppliers in the market, so it makes sense to go through one or more. And as I mentioned, you get those economies of scale that are buying in bulk and a cheaper price. There are some disadvantages though, like losing control of the supply chain. They're obviously going to charge you a lot of money to do this for you, those tiered suppliers, those first tiers. And it could end up being a situation like with Tesco's, where there was horse meat in their burgers. This was because of a complex supplier tiering system. Another area that you could talk about is just in time. Just in time is a feature of what's known as stock to order procurement, basically where you make to order. Just in time or JIT is centered around only ordering enough stock to fulfill your current customer orders. And this can add value and reduce cost to the business. So there are savings in not having to hold, store, manage or ensure all of this stock. So all your money isn't tied up in this stock and therefore costing you money. If parts are of a perishable nature, this reduces the amount of stock lost to perishability because you're getting the goods straight in. In fact, the actual definition of just in time is never too early, nor too late, but just in time. So essentially things shouldn't perish and it should all run as it should. And it should be noted though, just like with tiering, there are risks to the JIT approach. If damaged stocks are received or faulty, there may be a risk that you can't meet your customer orders in time. So holding very little stock is a big risk, but it can add value and save money. And the final one that I've gone through here is stakeholder management. So remember, stakeholders are anyone with a vested interest in your organisation. And each stakeholder or stakeholder group has an element of power and interest in the organisation. Remember, we use Mendelow's power interest matrix to essentially map these stakeholders. And depending on the level of power and interest, procurement can manage these stakeholders in order to add value to the organisation and potentially reduce costs. So the key way that we can do that is managing our key suppliers. 
So key suppliers are what's known as connected stakeholders of the business. By managing the key suppliers, we, the buyer, can build relationships and trust between us and the supplier. This can help us when renegotiating contracts, and that can have a direct impact by reducing costs. There's also other value that this may bring, such as we might not, not just get security of supply, we might get prioritization of supply, i.e. we'll come first. Or they may agree to give donations, time or money to local causes and benefits, and this can improve the social value of the organization as well. So there's many benefits that we can get from stakeholder management. So I understand that that's a question that students might you know, freak out about if they see in the exam. But it's one that's actually fine. It, there's nothing wrong with this question. You could say a multiple of different things. You could say, talk about value engineering. You could talk about building sustainability in. You could talk about other things like supplier rationalization or supplier optimization, as we call it now. There are lots of different things. Anything that would reduce costs or add value can be discussed here and you'll get marks. So Remember, it's an explain command word, so you need to be explaining yourself. So everything you say, you need your statement, you need to then explain and ideally put back to an example. Now, in L4M8 with a case today, there may be something to link back to. In L4M1, you're going to have to think of your own examples to link back to. Maybe a situation in your organisation where you've managed stakeholders or invested in supplier tiering or whatever it may be. So I hope you found this useful. Please check back for a new one soon and I wish you all the best of luck in your exam. Bye for now.